So this is a uh, talk on what is therapeutic hypothermia and how does that help in the issue of a baby that may have had hypoxic ischemic brain injury. So for example, if you sprain your ankle, what do you do? You put ice on it, you elevate it, and you do not go running a marathon right away. You rest it. So how can we do the same thing for a brain that may have sustained a sprain or more of a severe injury? How do you rest it? By dropping the body temperature and therefore the brain temperature by even one degree, you reduce the cerebral metabolism, brain metabolism, by five to seven percent. And so therefore you're reducing the work the brain has to do. Since we cannot ever completely shut off the brain, we want it to not be stressed it more in addition to whatever injury it's undergoing. So cooling allows us to drop the work that the brain is doing. It also has anticonvulsant properties, meaning it actually changes the neurochemical so that it's more difficult for the brain cells to fire off. We don't, again, want to suppress the brain activity, but we do not want it to do bad things such as seizures, which is what an acutely injured brain can do to tell you, I'm not feeling well. And so cooling, again, has anticonvulsant properties, making it more difficult for those brain cells to have seizures. It can have anti-inflammatory properties, um, meaning reducing the edema and swelling, just like when you put ice on a sprained ankle. And it can also decrease the ability of that brain cell to go undergo cell death, or what we call apoptotic cell death. So this is why cooling works. It's not affecting just one mechanism of how the brain can be injured, but multiple mechanisms. And this is probably why therapeutic cooling has been the first, hopefully there'll be additional, but the first thing that has actually translated with success from bench to bedside for the newborn baby. When did this all start? In 2005 were the first two phase three published trials demonstrating efficacy as measured by the outcomes of death or disability by 18 or 24 months of age in babies who had received brain cooling. By 2010, you had the announcements by the American Academy of Pediatrics as well as the American Heart Association stating that in the neonatal resuscitation, if there is clinical history suggesting the baby may have sustained a hypoxic ischemic insult that you stop and consider actually turning off the radiant warmer and allowing the baby's body temperature to drop and actually considering whether the therapeutic cooling would be beneficial for that baby. So in five years from the first phase three trials, you had over a thousand babies exposed to one phase three trial or not, or another, demonstrating efficacy and the number needed to treat is somewhere between six or seven infants where you can change the outcome in one out of every six to seven infants exposed to cooling. Um, and this is why now it is the standard of care, uh, not just here in the U.S., but throughout the world. Um, there, and it is therapies that are being even attempted with ice packs in countries that don't have access to the technology and cooling blankets that we have here in the U.S. So then the question becomes, besides brain cooling, what does that mean? So the easy part is actually putting a cooling blanket around the baby's head or under the baby, which is what we call whole body cooling. So these are two methods of cooling a baby. There are other methods that are available to the adult population, but does not work um, or is not offered in the newborn population. Um, both of these methods are relatively easy. Um, but as you can imagine, the surface area of your head is much smaller than the surface area of your body. Granted, it is better in a newborn than an adult, but even in a newborn, the surface area of your head is only 20% of your body surface area. And if the goal is to try to drop the temperature of the brain as soon as possible to initiate the cooling, then using a larger surface area may be more beneficial. But the goal is to, again, drop the temperature to a core temperature, meaning a rectal or esophageal temperature of anywhere between 33 and a half versus 34 degrees. It has to be initiated within six hours of life, continued for 72 hours. You may ask why 72 hours, sort of going back to that sprained ankle analogy. If you wait even a few hours or put the ice on tomorrow, it does not help. And as you can imagine, the swelling gets worse for about a day or two before it stops. And therefore, that's why the cooling has to be initiated within six hours of life, or it has only been demonstrated to be efficacious if initiated within six hours of life. 
and then it needs to be maintained for 72 hours to get us through that peak brain swelling period. And then they're gradually rewarmed for half a degree an hour. As the healthcare provider at the bedside, what you can do besides putting the baby on a cooling blanket is to actually provide neurosupportive care. And to me, that is as equally important as dropping the baby's um, body temperature uh, for therapeutic cooling. It is basically doing what the baby's brain should be doing, which is regulating their blood pressure, their heart rate, their electrolytes, their sugars. Because if the blood pressure is too low, then we're causing more hypoxic ischemic injury. If the sugar is too low, the energy source, then it's like adding and contributing more injury. If the sugar is too high, then you're actually creating more toxic end products that could also then injure cells or in that area of injury. Um, these are all things that are very important. And so what you're doing is basically doing what the hypothalamus and the brainstem would be doing for these babies, breathing for the babies, uh, maintaining their sugars, maintaining their blood pressures. And these are things that are also more likely to be abnormal in the moderate, severely brain injured, hypoxic ischemic infant. And the time period of concern is not necessarily the first 24 hours, but it's gonna get worse in the second 24 hours of life because again, that's when the peak brain swelling occurs, sort of like, um, for example, if I were to punch someone, when would you be the best time to come see the bruise? right away, tomorrow, a week later. It'd be tomorrow. So anticipate that if you're already seeing signs of electrolyte or glucose or blood pressure instability in that first 24 hours, that the second 24 hours you need to actually be more vigilant because it's likely to be worse than what it was in that first 24 hours before it starts to get better. It's also this true in terms of looking for neurologic symptoms of brain injury. So the brain can do bad things, not just good things. And one thing it can do that's bad is have seizures. It's the brain's way of telling you, I don't feel well. Um, it's not that they have a seizure disorder. And again, that peak time period of seeing the seizures begin and where they're gonna very explode in terms of their frequency and seizure burden is gonna be in that peak swelling period. So the majority of the seizures in babies with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy will be in the first 36 hours of life. Um, and again, that's the time period that you need to see and, and look and keep your eyes open for and personally actually do EEG monitoring because these babies will seize in different parts of their brain that may not be related with motor function. So you may not see any motor manifestation of their seizures because it is all occurring only electrographically. So for example, if the seizures are in that part of your brain that has to do with vision, how would you know the baby who's sick and nonverbal is having hallucinations or visual difficulty? won't know that at all. If it spreads forward to involve your motor areas, then yes, you may see the jerking and twitching that you people have of, of, in, in their minds of what a seizure looks like. But that may not always be the case in the, all depending on where that brain injury is and where the seizures are occurring from. And so again, these are things that you want to do to try to mitigate because having one or two seizures are probably not gonna change the outcome of that baby. But having seven, 10 continual seizures for hours on end, that is probably gonna add to that brain injury and that's what you, you know, our job will be to try to again, prevent that from happening because the whole point of whole body cooling was to prevent the brain from doing too much work. Seizures is actually more work for the, the brain and we want to prevent that brain from working too much when it's not feeling very well. In terms of brain cooling, uh, neurosupportive care, these are the things that you need to monitor, um, you know, using the analogy of, again, Goldilocks. For me, the bedside nurse is the most important person bes besides that cooling blanket for these babies because they are functioning as that brainstem and hypothalamus for the baby, alerting us when things may be going awry um, and not uh, getting better or being stable. Uh, and then also being aware of the potential complications to expect during cooling. Um, so I've already mentioned about the electrolytes and blood pressures. Those things may naturally go awry after brain injury. Again, cooling actually tends to exacerbate that too. So 
that's something expected, that you expect the heart rate to get lower, therefore the blood pressure to drop, um, their glucose may be more abnormal than it would be if they're on a cooling blanket. And again, it's that second 24 hours that you're gonna be um, worried about if it's already becoming abnormal and or extreme in that first 24 hours of life. Um, so in conclusion, cooling is standard of care for newborns. It's, that is not true in the pediatric or adult population, but in the NICU, neonatal and the near-term term infant, that is standard of care. Um, whether it's by whole body cooling or selective head cooling, that there, there are no exact recommendations for. Um, it is encouraged that you do neuromonitoring not required, but those regulations may be changing in the coming years as we, um, there are coming d data from studies indicating uh, that uh, brain monitoring the form of EEGs um, may be actually helpful in um, Im improving their outcomes. Obviously brain imaging to me, um, knowing whether your child actually has brain injury or not is pretty important and also important in helping answer the most important question for the parent. Um, what is the effect that this is going to have or will it have an effect? And without a brain uh, image, that would be very hard for anyone to be able to predict. Um, and these are the, the essentials for therapeutic cooling.